Well, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Greg Fleming, and I'm one of the residents in zoological medicine at the University of Florida. Our service sees a wide range of animals, including exotic animals, not only fish and reptiles, amphibians, birds, and small pets, but also zoo and wildlife species. We have a number of people on faculty and about uh, four veterinarians, a uh, number of technicians, and then we teach the students on a daily basis. I took this exam about four or five years ago, and I've been talking to people over the last number of years about the different questions that have been on the test. So hopefully we'll have a good uh, cross-section of what I've heard them talking about. So today we're going to cover exotics. And really what that's going to entail is reptiles and some amphibians, avian, which are the birds, pocket pets, which are the small mammals, and fish. Now it's obvious that there's, this is a huge range of species and different topics, and I'm just going to kind of go on the, the small number of questions I've heard about and the most common diseases. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but I think it should be a good introduction to this. The other thing is that on this examination, only a small percentage of questions should be about exotics. So it's not that crucial like other sections such as small animal medicine, but I think it can still add to your score that you're going to end up getting. So first of all, we're going to talk about reptiles. The most important thing with respect to reptiles is their husbandry. And this could actually be said for avian and pocket pets and all the other exotic animals we see. Most of the problems that we see with these animals are respect to their husbandry, how they're fed, how they're cared for and looked after. So that's an important point to think of when you're reading the test um, and there's a question with respect to these animals that you just use common sense and know about the husbandry of certain animals. Um, for example, reptiles have to have warmer enclosures. Um, rabbits have to have a certain amount of roughage in their diet and they should be fed hay and they shouldn't just be fed, you know, fruits and vegetables and some things like that. So you just have to think about husbandry related questions when you're going into this. And we can see here reptiles cover a vast variety of animals and there's over 6,500 species of reptiles. So there's no way you're ever going to know all the different reptiles and all the problems they can have. But you should be able to generalize between them. And you can see here, for example, we have a tortoise, a red foot tortoise there grazing, a green iguana, and a chondra python. These animals are totally different, and they, some eat vegetables, some eat uh, mammals and birds, and so we have to know the specifics for each one of them. And that, as a veterinarian, when you get out and you're working on these animals, it's going to be your responsibility to know the species by buying a couple of good books. And you're never going to know all the species, so you have to get these books to look up the requirements of each animal. In general, reptiles get gram-negative infections. So that's important with respect to how we treat them. The most common ones we normally see are Pseudomonas and Aeromonas. These two things are found commonly on the skin of reptiles. However, they can also be found in things like dirty water bowls in their enclosures. So it's always very important to clean those water bowls out on a daily basis. You should be able to say, okay, I see that water bowl, I would drink out of it. If you wouldn't drink out of it, it needs to be cleaned with soap and water. So they're very common to see in that respect. The other big one is salmonella. We talk about salmonella all the time. Here in the United States, uh, turtles under four inches are not allowed to be sold because of the salmonella threat. You can basically consider all reptiles have salmonella, and that's what I tell people. So salmonella can cause a variety of things, including enteritis with people and bloody diarrhea, just like it does in horses and dogs. The thing we have to be careful of is people handle these animals, not wash their hands, and then go to eat or get fecal oil ingestion somehow. So what we have to really worry about with salmonella is particularly very old people, people who are immune compromised, and very young people handling reptiles. And this is why they don't sell turtles under four inches, because they think that uh, little kids can put the turtles in their mouth and maybe suck on them and then get salmonella in the, ingested that way. So just remember, consider all reptiles have salmonella, and so people shouldn't be cleaning their water bowls in their, in their sink or kitchen sink or anywhere they're going to prepare food in case of the cross-contamination with that. And they should use cleaners that can actually, you know, take care of the salmonella. And here we can see a few other ones like Morganella and Clubsiella as well. 
So because reptiles mainly have gram-negative bacteria, our selection of antibiotics for them is more leaning towards the gram-negative side. And that could potentially be uh, enrofloxacin is used very commonly in reptiles. You can use it for an injection. We don't like to use enrofloxacin in an injection that much because enrofloxacin can cause um, a lot of muscle necrosis and it's very painful to inject. The other things we can commonly use are penicillin-based drugs, such as cefazidine is very popular these days. It works very well. It's injectable. It's only every three days and the teftazidine does not cause muscle necrosis. Some other things that people commonly use are aminoglycosides, such as amikacin. They work very well, but you have to make sure that the reptile is adequately hydrated because it can cause nephrotoxicity, just like it can in mammals and other species. So once again, we can see the crossover from mammals and other things, and you know these things, and you just have to be able to apply them from mammals into things like reptiles. The interesting thing about this gram-negative bacteria and infections in reptiles is they, they form caseous pus. So what is caseous pus? It's kind of like shaped and um, the same texture as a hard cheese. It does not liquefy. And the reason is is that reptiles really lack an enzyme in their, in their bodies to liquefy the pus. So it starts caseous in mammals and the enzyme liquefies it into pus. However, in reptiles, it just stays caseous. So why do we care about that? Well, if they get an infection or an abscess, this turns into a hard lump and cannot be removed from the body. It's very difficult for the body's immune system to remove that caseous pus. So we have to go in and actually cure it out that pus. So that's very important. So you're not going to be able to clear that infection unless you remove the pus. So when we see things like infectious stomatitis, which is also known as mouth rot in iguanas, where they can have a big abscess on the side of the face, I'll show in a minute here, we would incise over the incision, incise over the wound, and take out the pus and flush it very well to make sure that pus is out of there. Now, why do they get these infections? And we see infections in these animals all the time. One of the big things is improper husbandry. Reptiles really need to be at a preferred optimum temperature zone of between 85 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. They must reach that temperature for their immune system and all their enzyme systems in the body to work correctly. If they do not reach that temperature, it will, the immune system will not function correctly, and then that's why we can get maybe an infection where we shouldn't in a healthy animal. So it's very important, once again, to keep those reptiles between that 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and then they will be able to clear infections very easily. One of the most common problems we see in reptiles is something called metabolic bone disease. This is seen in iguanas and many insect-eating lizards. And here we can see a picture of one of the iguanas with this disease. The clinical signs are usually, the classic sign is young iguanas that may only be less than like eight or nine inches long. They may show up with lameness or very soft bones. And that's what's showing here on this iguana. What happens is, I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology in a minute, but then when the bones become soft, the muscles end up pulling on them, and in the jaw, at least, it'll push back and pull towards the iguana. You can see that here. That's why his mouth is so swollen. Then they also get caseous abscesses as well. The other thing you may see is if someone brings you a, a young iguana that's got fractures of its back or its legs, or it could have mouth rot, the infectious stomatitis with the abscesses. Or the other very classic sign is chunky legs. And what I mean by that is when you look at the iguana, it kind of looks like a little Arnold Schwarzenegger iguana, and it's very thick legs and arms. And the reason that is is because the iguana is not able to <clears throat> absorb calcium through its environment, and we'll talk about it in a sec. However, the bones become soft, and then the iguana starts putting down fibrous tissue around those bones, like as a splint to, to keep the bones solid, and it thickens the bones with the fibrous tissue. So it looks like they're really chunky and got a lot of meat on them, but when you palpate that um, leg, it'll feel very hard like rock, and that's not a good thing. So what's the pathophysiology of metabolic bone disease? Well, it's, it's fairly complicated, and it doesn't really, you don't really know, need to know the exact pathophysiology, but it's basically a relationship between UV light, calcium, 
vitamin D, phosphorus, and parathyroid hormones and calcitonin. The most important thing here is UV light. Iguanas need UV light to change vitamin D3 into a form that can actually bind with calcium in their diet and be absorbed. If they don't have the UV light, they cannot metabolize the vitamin D3, and then they cannot absorb the calcium. Then the body is looking for calcium and starts pulling it from the bones. So really, we have two different ways of this metabolic bone disease happening. The UV light deficiency, and then in things like the insect-eating lizards, in the wild they eat a variety of insects that have different calcium to phosphorus ratios. Here in captivity, we feed them crickets. Now, a good calcium to phosphorus ratio should be two calcium for every one phosphorus, a two to one phosphorus, calcium to phosphorus ratio. However, things like crickets are opposite. They have a one to nine calcium to phosphorus ratio. So you can see how we're skewing this. So this is the most important thing. The husbandry must include for iguanas and many species of lizards that live in the light and sunlight, not nocturnal species, is to have UVB light. And it must be between the wavelength of 290 to 320 nanometers. So if they do not have this 220 to 300, uh, sorry, 290 to 320 nanometer uh, wavelength of light, they cannot metabolize the vitamin D3 and they cannot absorb calcium. Now, we have some lights like you can see here in the slide that you can buy commercially that actually provide some of that UV light. You must be very specific and you as a veterinarian must look at these lights on the packaging to see if they actually produce any of this wavelength. Many of them don't. Here are some of the better ones. And so you have to look on there and see what the wavelength is. If it is not 290 to 320, it's useless. Now, even the best reptile light only produces about 5% of the same light that the sun would produce, the same UVB of 290 to 320. So they're not that good. The other thing is they really need to be changed about every six months because they lose this UVB um, rating. The other thing is, unless the animal's within 18 inches of that light, he will not absorb that UVB um, because it'll dissipate before it gets to him. So it's very important to have one of these full spectrum light bulbs that have UV, UVB between 290 and 320. They should be changed every six months and the animal has to be within 18 inches of that light to get any good of it. Now, if you live down here in Florida or South Florida, for example, there's really no excuse for an animal to have this. The best thing and the most inexpensive way of looking after these animals is to have them outside in the summer. And so, when you're outside, there's no replacement for natural sunlight. And it's been shown that with some places, even if you're in a cooler climate slightly north of here, or even in the Midwest, where it's warm enough in the summer but cold in the winter, you could have the iguana outside in a cage, exposed to sunlight all summer long, and then have them inside in the winter with one of these UV bulbs, and they should do just fine. The key is getting them outside. Even if you can only get them outside for an hour or two a day, that's probably enough uh, for these iguanas so they can absorb the UVB, metabolize vitamin D3, and absorb the calcium. Very important. So how do you diagnose this? Well, when the animals come in, remember I talked about the chunky legs, the pushed in face, um, fractures, soft bones, and you can also take blood on them. If they have a blood calcium of less than nine milligrams per deciliter, that's probably one of the big signs. Now, if you see these classic physical signs like the soft bones or the pushed in face um, and the blood calcium is still higher than that, you can't really say it's not metabolic bone disease. It probably is, but what's happening is the animal's still taking enough calcium out of its bones that it can compensate. Only the very sickest of these iguanas will have uh, calcium of less than nine milligrams per deciliter, so it's very important to see. So what do we do for therapy? Well, the most important thing is to start supportive care, make sure they're being kept at a proper temperature, proper humidity, proper food level. But the most important thing is UV light. If at all possible, it's important to get these animals out into the sunlight, at least for an hour or two a day. But they can't be just left out there baking in the full sunlight all the time. But they, they need to get the UV light. If it's the middle of winter where you're at, you need to get the full spectrum light bulbs that these animals can, can get under so they can start absorbing. 
The other thing I usually do is supplement them with calcium, the liquid neocalgluconate that you can buy at the pharmacy, and it's usually um, about a mil per kilogram of iguana twice a day. And also the other thing is you can do vitamin D. There are a number of uh, supplements available on the market that have calcium and vitamin D3 in them. Now, I would never use one of these supplements that has phosphorus as well because you're just, you know, going against what you need. You need the calcium and the vitamin D3. And so you can buy the one. Uh, there's one from T-Rex that actually has, um, it's got a pink label, and it's only calcium and vitamin D3 with no phosphorus. So that's very important. And then once the bones start healing, if they have fractures and they have enough calcium on board, you need to do fracture repair. I also suggest that the people, because iguanas are arboreal and live high up into the, in the cage, that they remove all, all the perches so the animal doesn't crawl up there and fall off and break something else and just keep them on the floor of the cage. Okay, on to some turtle and tortoise problems. Vitamin A deficiency is very, very common. This is also common in birds as well that are on feed diets. Really, it's, it's from an inappropriate diet. And the clinical signs uh, are blepharoedema, edema, which is big, swollen, puffy eyes, and they're usually shut. The animal's leth lethargic. It's just lying there with its head out of its shell. And, uh, usually weight loss, but most of the clients don't know what they weighed in the first place. And a lot of times it can have nasal or ocular discharge. The pathophysiology of this is um, squamous cell metaplasia. So what's happening is the lack of vitamin A is causing your mucosal membranes to turn into squamous cells, and you basically turning into skin, you use the loss of your mucociliary apparatus, and then things back up or don't work very properly. The other thing you can see if it's tortoises, land-based tortoises, is they can get hyperkeratosis of their epithelium and get this thickening of the skin, as well as ocular respiratory problems, endocrine problems, uh, gastrointestinal problems and urinary tract problems. All because you, anywhere where there's mucosa, you're going to have a problem. So the most important thing here is to get vitamin A into them. However, vitamin A is different from some of the other vitamins like vitamin C. Vitamin C is water soluble, so if you take a lot of vitamin C and there's excess, it just passes through your system and it's excreted in the urine. Vitamin A, however, is fat soluble. So it's very easy to overdose an animal with vitamin A. So the most important thing here is, is you have to look up the dose, and even if it's a small tortoise or turtle, you might have to cut the vitamin A down so as not to overdose the animal because there's a lot of problems with overdosing, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And you must also potentially increase the husbandry, change the husbandry around, change the food source, and probably the best thing for a lot of these aquatic turtles anyways is to buy the pre-made um, turtle diets that have the appropriate amount of vitamin A in them. You must also treat for secondary infections. Because the mucosa is turning into basically skin, they're, and they're not being able to clear infection properly, you're more likely going to have to start them on antibiotics such as enrofloxacin if they're eating or something like septazamine if they're not. So what happens... Um, if you're treating for a hypovitaminosis A and you give a tortoise an injection of vitamin A, if it's fat soluble, it'll stay in the system, and what will end up happening is the animal will become anorexic, it can even vomit, and it'll cause dry, flaky skin at first. You'll see the skin in a very mild case kind of flaking off like it was a very bad sunburn. But in very bad cases, it'll actually slough the skin off. And, and 7 to 10 days after the animal comes to you, you overdose it with this vitamin A, the skin will start falling off. So that's an important point to remember here. If you get a case on, on the exam and they're talking about tortoises or turtles with skin fluffing off, this could definitely be one of the rule outs, um, iatrogenic vitamin A. And how you treat this basically is just supportive care, cover those wounds, and people have also given steroids uh, to help with the inflammation. Another problem in large tortoises, specifically Galapagos and Aldabra tortoises, and this is a picture of a Galapagos tortoise here, is iodine deficiency. Also known, we know it as goiter. The clinical signs in these large tortoises is really they're just lethargic, 
and you'll see a swelling at the, uh, of the thyroid near the thoracic inlet. And here you can see on this tortoise, he should have a nice neck going back into his body. You can see the big lump uh, just um, um, distal to his chin, distal and ventral. The reason we think this happens is because they're not getting enough iodine in their diet. And there are also a number of vegetables that maybe can actually block the iodine, such as um, uh, bok choy, broccoli, cabbage, kale, and turnip have been uh, known to be a dietary uh, goiterogen, so they can maybe potentially block it. But you should not feed these animals those things because of that. More than likely, it's just a deficiency in iodine in general. So the pathophysiology of this in tortoises is exactly the same as in mammals or budgies or any other animal. The lack of iodine, you need iodine for your thyroid metabolism and for T3 and T4 to uh, be metabolized. So if you do not get this, your thyroid responds by becoming hyperplastic. The therapy is very easy in this. It's diet, diet modification, and usually um, we can fix it by using iodine supplementation with iodized salt or kelp powder. And what kelp powder is, kelp obviously is a um, plant that grows in the ocean and has a high content of salt. So you can buy it at a nature store and sprinkle a little bit of the salt, uh, kelp powder onto the uh, vegetables you're eating. And as soon as you start iodine supplementation, within a few weeks, um, the thyroid will reduce its size and the animal should be fine. So that is um, goiter in large tortoises or iodine deficiency. Okay, I can cover a few other reptile diseases here that are quite common and have been known to have been on the board exams. Blister disease is also known as dermatitis, and this can happen to a number of reptiles that are kept in improper conditions. Usually it's desert type species or, or arid environment species such as a ball python that is kept too moist. And what I mean by too moist is if you can see condensation on the cage walls from humidity, um, this creates a really moist, warm environment, and bacteria will grow on the, usually the ventral surface of the animal, causing dermatitis, and it'll blister up. It looks like someone's burnt the skin, and then these blisters will slough off. And this is commonly known as blister disease, but really it's just dermatitis. And then to compound it, people haven't changed the water in the bowl, they're getting a pseudomonas or arginos, uh, pseudomonas infection in these wounds. And this can be taken care of very easily by drying out the environment, cleaning the wounds with something like chlorhexidine, and putting sulfur sulfidizing ointment on it, and just keeping them clean. And they should usually heal by just changing the environment around. That's very common. Another thing we see is egg stasis, and this is also known as egg binding. And here we can see a picture of one of a tortoise that has it, and you can see a number of eggs in there, and this tortoise was lethargic, not doing very well, and we could see that the egg, it was blocked. This is very common in iguanas, too. And how we diagnose it is usually through um, clinical signs, the animal's depressed, um, has a swollen abdomen, it's anorexic, it's not eating, and we take radiographs and we can see the eggs in there. And usually we have to either try medical management to get those eggs out and then go to surgery. So in iguanas, too, it can also be eggs and it can also be follicles. Follicles are before the, egg sh the shell has been put on the egg, and you can usually tell that by the amount of calcium that's deposited around it, but it's the same treatment. Um, usually if it's follicular stasis, you have to go in surgically and remove those. So any iguana or um, tortoise that's lethargic, maybe not eating radiographs would be a good thing to see if the eggs are in there. Another classic problem you see in reptiles is thermal burns. And they get these from hot rocks. And this is a picture um, on the right here of a Komodo dragon that had a burn. Um, I just took this picture about a week ago. It had a burn from a hot rock over a year ago, and it's still healing. Hot rocks are basically what they sound like. It's a rock you put into um, an iguana's or a reptile's enclosure that has a plug in. You plug it into the wall, and it heats up. The problem with hot rocks is over time, they tend to malfunction. You should be able to put your hand on any heating device for a reptile, besides a hot light, and hold it there for a minute. If you cannot hold your hand on that hot rock for a minute, it's too hot, and these things malfunction over time. And reptiles also really aren't designed for heating up from the, their abdomen. I mean, sometimes at night they'll crawl into warm things, but in the day they're really responsive to heat from above, but not from below. 
So the animal ends up sitting on this hot rock. The hot rock heats up too much, and it actually ends up burning the skin. It can actually cook internal organs, and the animals will not get off it. Because they're losing so much heat from the rest of the body, they're only taking in heat from the ventral aspect, and their brain is telling them they still have to heat up so they stay on that heat source, and they will burn themselves very badly. So you should never have a hot rock in a cage. Reptiles should have heating. They have underfloor heating that goes up under the aquarium, and then that does, it's warm enough. You just put it on. It should feel like a nice warm water bottle, and it should not be very hot. Um, somewhere around 90 degrees. So if you, once again, if you can't keep your hand on it for a minute, it's too hot. Then to manage those thermal burns, you have to do the same thing as you would do in the guardian cat. You might have to do debulking of the, of the necrotic tissue, wet to dry, and chronic wound management. And you can see here it's a very long process. This Komodo dragon is still healing and it's been over a year since the injury. Now I'd like to talk about amphibians. Well, one of the main things amphibians get is something called red leg. And here you can see, um, I didn't have a great picture of this, but this is kind of like a little toad that's being restrained, and this is what it looks like. It's septicemia, and they just get a hyperemia in their legs. And these also amphibians are inflicted by gram-negative bacteria. Aramonis, um, Flavobacter, and actually Chlamydiophila can also cause problems in, in amphibians. This is all with respect to poor husbandry, once again, they usually kept in water that's not very clean. The water should be crystal clear, it should be changed, it should be filtered. And when they're not, they will get this. The big thing is to make sure you're treating the right, right problem is to take the animal out of the environment um, and culture um, the leg to see what, what organism is growing. You have to work on this very quickly because it can progress quite fast over a number of days. So you can do supportive care, uh, make sure they're in the proper environment to begin with, and then start them on antibiotics such as enrofloxacin, amicacin, or gentamicin. These can be injected into the animal itself, or they can actually be put topically in the water. Amphibians have very poor skin, and you have to put it in the water with them, and it will be absorbed systemically. And these are all in um, our book called um, Reptile Medicine and Surgery by Doug Nader. So you shouldn't be asked. Um, exact dosages on the test. So I'm not covering them here, but that will be in that textbook. Okay, we're going to talk about avian species now. The interesting thing about avian species is there are five major diseases that we see in the ones I'm going to talk about today. Mainly I'm going to focus on parrots or pet species and not poultry. Um, the, most of the Parrot diseases start with P, so that's easy to remember, P and parrot. And there's five of them, and then there's one additional one, aspergillosis. So the ones I'm going to talk about today are psittacosis, which is chlamydiophila, Pacheco's disease, cytosine decompetor disease, polyoma, proventricular dilatory disease, and aspergillosis. And here we can see a nice picture of a female eclectus parrot. Prostitocosis, this is a very common disease we see, and it's seen across the United States. Recently, it was called Chlamydia um, psittaci, and it's been changed to Chlamydia phila psittaci. Chlamydia is a problem because it's an intracellular parasite, so it's very difficult to treat. Any sick bird could have this. If you have a bird that comes in that's fluffed up, sitting there, Chlamydia should be on your rule-out list. And the first thing we do is take blood, and it's usually if we see a white blood cell count of about 50,000, that could clue us on to this. There's a couple of these diseases, um, usually tuberculosis, psittacosis or chlamydia, and aspergillosis all have white blood cell counts over 50,000. So those are the big three. So that was psittacosis, um, which is chlamydia, aspergillosis, and avian tuberculosis all cause white blood cell counts over 50,000. So how do we diagnose this? If you had a bird that had a high white blood cell count, was looking like this bird here, all fluffed up, well, there's a number of tests to do. Because it's an intracellular parasite, it's very difficult to get a one test. You have to put everything together. But there are antibody tests um, and PCRs for chlamydia, and then you have to do that along with the white blood cell count. Chlamydia usually goes and causes problems in the liver and reproduces in the liver, so you're going to have elevated liver signs as well. So if you have a fluffed up bird, not eating, not acting right, that's got elevated liver enzymes, a high white blood cell count of let's say over 50,000, 
and then you send off some tests, you get a positive antibody titer to the um, chlamydia, that would probably be considered a chlamydia case. It can be treated very easily and very effectively. Um, you can use doxycycline, which is an injectable. It's once a week for seven weeks. Or you can use enrofloxacin or Batril. And that can be, that's not quite as good, but it can also work very well. And that would have to be given daily for about three weeks. The other thing you have to be worried about with chlamydia, it is zoonotic, so people can catch it. This tends um, not to be the same one we get. Most humans get chlamydia filla um, pneumonitis, or I'm not sure exactly, but it is not the same type that we get here that the parrots get. However, people have been known to get the chlamydia filla psittacide. So we're going to have to see over the next couple of years if it's the same species. Before they were talking in people that it was the same, and people used to call this birder's lung. They could pet, definitely get chlamydia from parrots. So it is zoonotic, so if you have an animal that is positive for this, you must warn the people about it. And I never comment to the people on how they need to, to handle it, except, you know, go to the doctor and say their parrot has been tested positive for chlamydia philocytosi and let their human doctor take care of it for them. Pacheco's disease. This is herpes virus. And birds get herpes, everything gets herpes, all mammals, reptiles, everyone has their own strand of herpes virus. It's usually associated with conures, and here I have a picture of a dusky conure. Conures are from South America, and there's numerous species of them. They tend to be the small to medium-sized parrots. And how you notice this is if you have a collection of healthy birds, you bring a new parrot into the collection, and then you have a cute die-off very close to when this bird came in, this is a very classic sign of Pacheco's disease. A number of birds become carriers, just like with other herpes virus. The herpes lives in the nerves, and it can migrate out during times of stress, which is when a parrot would be brought into your facility. It's being transported and stressed, breaks with it, gives it to the other parrots. They're naive, and it wipes them out. So usually what happens is you can find a, one of the birds, which is like the typhoid Mary that comes into your question. He does fine, and everyone else starts dying around him. And this can be diagnosed, they will have to be diagnosed off the history of an acute die-off with new birds coming into this uh, area or through histopath virus isolation and post-mortem of the birds. So just remember that if you get a bird coming in and you're getting an uh, acute die-off of a flock and it's a conure, it can also happen in other birds but mainly conures, that could definitely be Pacheco's. Citizen beacon feather disease. This is a very devastating disease that usually affects cockatoos. Now, it can affect some of the other large parrots, but it's mainly cockatoos. Lovebirds can also get it, and you shouldn't rule out any of the big parrots if you're seeing these signs. It's a circovirus, and what it does is it gets into the cells that are differentiating in connective tissue and in the feathers and the beak. The classic sign are things called club feathers, and here you can see on the bottom picture that there's actually some feathers and they normally grow out like this but these ones will grow and then stop growing and you'll see these birds that just look like they've stopped in mid mold. The other thing that happens is you can get beak dystrophy and you can see that the, the cockatoo on the top and you get these terribly overgrown beaks or beaks that are damaged or moving or twisting around and torquing in different directions. This is a really bad disease because it's slowly progressive. Um, there are tests for it. You can do send off blood serum and once the bird has it, there's no treatment, and it will just slowly progress. It could be over a couple months, but it could be up to a year, um, and eventually it will kill a parrot, and there's no treatment for this. So once these birds are identified, they need to be isolated. So citizen beacon feather disease uh, can be seen in all the larger parrots, things like lovebirds, but mainly cockatoos. So you've got a cockatoo that's got funny feathers. Um, you should really have it tested for citizen beacon feather disease. Okay, the next one is polyoma. Polyoma is a, a papilo, papilo uh, viridae, and this is also known as budgerigar fledgling disease. And what is a budgerigar? Well, budgerigar is just a budgie, and here I have a picture of one. It can also affect other parrots. This is a disease of baby parrots and birds that are weaning in the nest less than 120 days old. So if you get a question with some blue and gold macaws, the breed is doing fine and starts to get die-offs in young parrots, um, but not the older parrots, that's the key here, only the young parrots, it's probably polyoma. 
and it goes into liver and acutely kills the parrots within a couple days. And the interesting thing is that the, the adults will tend to be just fine. The other place this um, has been seen, polyoma has been seen, is in pet stores where a bunch of babies from different sources are mixed together and maybe some have been exposed to it from their aviary and others are naive and you get a die off of babies. The other interesting thing about polyoma is that this is one of the few diseases that there's a vaccination for. Now, the vaccine is really only given to young birds, and it has there's a multiple injections. I think it's three to four injections of the vaccine, and it's fairly pricey. I think it's up to thirty dollars an injection. So, if you are a big bird breeder and you're sending your babies off to a pet store, a lot of these people will come in and have all their babies vaccinated the three times before they're sent to the pet store to protect them from the polyoma that could potentially come from other parrots at the pet store. Now, if someone comes in to you and says, look, I just bought this parrot from a pet store, I want it vaccinated, you need to talk to people about this. If the bird checks out, it's healthy and, you know, is doing fine in a physical exam, you do some blood work, has regular blood, normal blood work, um, I think really vaccinating that parrot at that point in time is not worth it. Usually the only people that really need to vaccinate them are maybe people that have big collections that are trying to protect them or babies going out of collections into a pet kind of pet trade area where they're going to have cross-contamination with other birds. Plus, it's very expensive. Um, like I say, it's probably going to cost you $100, $120 to vaccinate every bird that you have for it. The one other thing with that vaccine that's not known, the efficacy is not that great, and they think it may only protect for a number of months, so you have a narrow window to protect from. So um, just to remember about polyoma, it affects babies. The adults will be fine if you have a die-off of babies and the adults seem to be doing just great, then that could potentially be polyoma. Another disease is called proventricular dilatory disease, and this was also known as macaw wasting disease. Now, in the past number of years, we've uh, seen some viruses associated with it, so we actually think that there may be a viral cause, but it hasn't been fully worked out. Macaws, cockatoos, and other parrots have been shown to have this disease, um, like Amazon parrots from South America. The main sign is the bird seems to be doing fine, but starts passing undigested food in its feces, like pieces of seed or pieces of just food. And then the birds will start maybe doing some regurgitation or could potentially also have neurologic signs like encephalitis. And what we do is you'd have to do a full workup on this and do blood work, but the main clinical sign is um, there, should no, there shouldn't be a rise in white blood cell count. When you take an x-ray, there will be a dilated proventriculus. So what is a proventriculus? Well, the proventriculus is the part of the bird that is really considered its stomach, and it's the part that secretes all the enzymes, the digestive juices. So if we started the mouth, we would go mouth, esophagus, the crops in there in the esophagus, and then it goes esophagus proventriculus, and that's where the enzymes are secreted, and then ventriculus is the gizzard, and that's the muscular part that grinds it up. So the proventriculus is dilated and could take up, you know, two to three times its normal size, which could be half the saloma cavity of a bird. So what's happening is whatever the virus is doing, it's going in there and causing there to be no motility through the ventriculus, and it's just filling up with food, and the bird's not passing food and not digesting. So chronically, they start wasting and losing weight because they can't digest the food. And how we actually diagnose this is we would anesthetize that parrot and take a biopsy of one of the nerves that's running through the crop up here. Um, usually, we just find a little blood vessel, and there's usually an artery vein and a nerve running beside it. And we take a punch biopsy of that and submit it. And then uh, a lot of times we'll see the viral inclusion bodies in the ganglia of the nerve. It can also be taken a biopsy from the proventriculus, but that involves um, abdominal surgery, which can be risky. So for this disease, there's really no treatment. There's just palliative care. And that can be provided by feeding them a pelleted diet um, that is softened a little easier to digest, you feed it in smaller meals, and the birds should be able to break it down a lot easier than seed and should pass through them. But once they start regurgitating, really losing a lot of weight, there's really nothing else that can be done. So that's proventricular dilatory disease, or 
It was also known as macaw wasting disease because macaws were the first ones to be seen with it. Okay, the last in the series here is aspergillosis. <clears throat> aspergillosis is just a fungus like you see in dogs and uh, other animals, but a lot of parrots are very susceptible to it. It causes respiratory problems and pneumonia and air sacculitis. Usually it's related to birds that are chronically stressed, and because aspergillosis is everywhere, they inhale it, it goes in and starts growing in their lungs or their air sacs. We always talk about not giving birds multiple doses of steroids because we're very worried about causing immune um, compromise and aspergillosis growing. So they're very sensitive to steroids. African greys, as pictured here, are very common to get um, aspergillosis. Raptors, which are birds of prey, they're very stressed. When you bring them into your clinic and they're injured, um, they can get aspergillosis. Things like penguins, they're very susceptible because if you think of where a penguin comes, it's just basically frozen water and um, water and ice. There's really not a lot of aspergillosis there. I think like waterfowl are very, uh, ducks and geese are very compromised by aspergillosis. So like I said, they'll have a white blood cell count of over 50,000, maybe have some respiratory disease, and you diagnose it through either x-rays and maybe seeing the plaques doing endoscopy, going right in and taking a look around the, the lungs and, and the air sacs. And there's also um, some serologic testing for antibodies, but those may not be, there may be false positives with those because they may have a response to it, but they actually don't have the disease. So any of these birds are suspect of this, we start them on any fungal treatment. Now, if I get a, a, let's say, a bald eagle with a broken wing that comes into the clinic and it's from the wild, I will start it on itraconazole before it gets it as a prophylactic thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. So we use itraconazole, and sometimes we use fluconazole because fluconazole can actually penetrate the CNS and get into the brain. So if you have a bird that's positive for aspergillosis and showing neurologic signs, fluconazole would be your better choice. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about pocket pets. Pocket pets are very popular, and indeed with many apartment complexes and housing areas not allowing larger dogs and cats per, uh, in particular, these animals are becoming more popular. First thing, the first guys I'd like to talk about are ferrets. Uh, ferrets can make great little pets. They can live anywhere from like three to ten years, but they get a number of diseases that we see all the time. Adrenal disease is very common. It's been related to castrating and spaying these animals. Um, in North America, at least, all ferrets come from one breeding facility in upstate New York, which castrates and spays them at six weeks old. And then any time after that, usually it's about three years, they start uh, showing up with adrenal disease. And the main sign of adrenal disease is hair loss around the tail. And you can see in the top slide there, they get something what we call a rat tail, where they actually lose the hair around the base of their tail, and this can actually spread to the entire body if it's severe enough. And in females, they can get a swollen vulva, and you can see on the bottom, the bottom slide, it gets the vulva swells and maybe is about the size of a, a green pea. And why is it slightly different? Um, in, in ferrets, this really isn't Cushing's disease, like people say it's Cushing disease of ferrets, but what happens is you get, um, Hyperplasia of the adrenal glands, which is actually neoplastic. About half the time it's malignant and half the time it's about benign. And it starts pumping out um, adrenal hormones, but in ferrets it tends to pump out the sex steroids and not the um, glucocorticoid steroids. So in the ferrets it will pump out sex steroids, which shows up as the swollen vulva. And in males it can cause a prostate to swell. So how do we diagnose this? Well, but we found the best way of diagnosing this is through ultrasound. Um, we do the ultrasound on the abdomen and actually look at the size of the adrenal. Most adrenals are usually three to four millimeters. Anything over that, um, we start thinking of adrenal disease. And I've seen them up over uh, a centimeter for sure. How do we fix this? Well, there are some different types of um, um, medical treatments, but they just really do not work very well. Um, they're very palliative, and they've been shown not to have any longer lifespan than just leaving the ferret alone. The only real true surge, um, 
way to fix this is through surgery. The problem, though, is there's two adrenals. There's a left and a right. The left um, just sits off the cranial um, pole of the kidney, and the right actually does too, but it's adhered to the vena cava. So to do the right adrenal surgery is very difficult because the adrenal is sitting right on the vena cava, and you know, sometimes it actually invades the vena cava going right into it. So to peel that off can be very difficult, and if you actually slice that vena cava, you can be in a lot of trouble because the parrot could bleed out. So we do that surgery. We usually have blood standing by, and we use a number of times uh, a Satinsky clamp that actually is curved like this, and it hooks around the adrenal, and you can suture around it and then pull the adrenal off. It takes a bite out of the vena cava, but this is a very difficult disease to treat. <clears throat> However, once you've treated them, through surgery, removing the adrenal glands, they tend to do very well. Um, we haven't seen, we've seen a number of that have, a, there's no disposition to male or female or left or right or benign or malignant. You could have benign on one side, malignant on the other. If you have a malignant adrenal tumor, that can be bad because it metastasizes to the other organs and you have to give a, a guarded prognosis. If it's benign, it's that much better. The other couple diseases for us get are insulinomas. Well, insulinomas are of the pancreas, and in ferrets, they're slightly different than dogs and cats. In a dog and cat, um, they can be um, one single mass or a number of small masses that are usually visible by either ultrasound or when you're doing exploratory surgery. However, in ferrets, it's a diffuse disease. Occasionally, like, and I mean occasionally, you might see one to two millimeter uh, little pinpoints that are the adrenal tumors, or sorry, not the adrenal, the insulinoma, and these However, in ferrets, it's diffused through the entire pancreas. So surgery really isn't an option. How ferrets with insulinomas present is usually an older ferret, anywhere over two to three years, that's eating normally but seems to be losing weight, or seizuring. And that's very common. What will end up happening is they'll produce so much insulin, they become hypoglycemic. People call you on the phone, they're panicking, and the, the ferret is seizuring. So what to do for that? Well, the first thing I always tell them is try and get some sugar into the mouth and usually caro syrup, the corn syrup, or if they've got like anything like pancake syrup, or they could even make up um, a sugar, sugar paste and get it into the mouth of the ferret and get him back. Sometimes they'll have to come into you. You might have to put an IV line in and get the ferret back, um, back into normal glycemia. So then what do you do once you say, okay, we think it's a fer adrenal disease, or sorry, insulinoma, <laughs> Um, what you need to do is send tests for that. So we test the blood work and see, you might have to do a number of glucose tests to see where the glucose is. If the glucose is usually running below 60, that is maybe one of the diagnostic signs that this ferret has an insulinoma. The other thing is um, you can send off for an insulin level. If the insulin, or sorry, if the glucose is below 60 and different labs have different cutoffs, you can send in a match sample and they will test the insulin because they know the insulin below 60 um, should be a certain level. And if it's very high and it's still below 60, that's not right. There's something going wrong and you've got an insulinoma. There are a number of medications you can try medically to treat with and they bind up insulin or, or, or have an effect on the glucose, but they just don't work very well. And the ferrets really resent the taste of them. So I just don't use them that often. Um, surgery is not really an option because you just have to go and cut out half of the pancreas and it's been shown that the mean survival time after surgery is no longer than if you did not manage it. The big thing we end up doing is using prednisone um, as a steroid that actually uh, helps um, with the insulin regulation and I only use that as a last resort if the ferret's starting to seizure quite a bit. Um, the other thing I do is just have people feed the ferret on a more routine basis and use like the moist cat foods that they really like and feed them a number of small meals throughout the day and that way they can usually manage them a little better than just like plopping down a bunch of food letting them eat once. And that seems to work very well and you might get six months to a year uh, out of the ferret. So insulinomas, seizuring, and diffuse disease through the, uh, through the pancreas. The other thing uh, the ferrets tend to get is lymphoma. There's two forms of lymphoma. If it's a young ferret, let's say less than two years old, they can get a chronic form of, of lymphoma that usually kills them within a month or two. So there's not much you can really do about that. The other lymphoma they get tends to be a chronic lymphoma in older ferrets that are a couple years old. 
usually shown by enlarged lymph nodes. Um, maybe the ferret's starting to waste a bit. They're losing muscle mass, even though they're eating lots. And it tends to be a GI lymphoma, and they're losing protein because they can't absorb it through the GI tract. And really, um, this can be diagnosed through biopsying lymph nodes or actually taking a biopsy of the intestine or doing blood work and, and seeing what the lymphocyte count is. But usually it's your biopsies and uh, needle biopsies or aspirates from the lymph nodes in the GI tract that are going to be your most diagnostic. And really, um, in the chronic cases, there's just not much you can do. You can try steroids for a while, but um, palliative care is about all you can do for that. The other thing ferrets get is a number of different um, diarrhea diseases. Uh, the most common one is called green slime disease. And this is when they get this really mucoid, green, slimy disease and it's, uh, diarrhea. And it's usually associated uh, with a visit to other ferrets or they've been somewhere new. And this can definitely, um, this is definitely in the history. They've usually had the ferret outside the house or they've just acquired a new ferret. And their older ferret that's been there breaks with this diarrhea. And what it is, it's just a ferret coronavirus that infects the intestine. And the ferret at the house hasn't been exposed to it. The other guy has. He comes in. He gives it to him breaks with this diarrhea. And the treatment for this is just basically palliative. The coronavirus should pass, but it wipes out the tips of the villi and in the intestine. So you have to do force feeding. We usually start them on amoxicillin and metronidazole because the GI tract is compromised and you can get infection in there. And force feeding fluids uh, as well. And this should take, it can take the longest I've ever seen is, you know, anywhere from three to seven days of supportive care to get them through it. Once they start uh, for forming um, stool that's nice and formed, uh, you can release them from the hospital and stop the antibiotics. The problem with this disease is it tends to be chronic. If you have a number of ferrets, it can kind of cycle through the, the ferrets and over and continually just go back and forth through the ferrets. If you only have one or two ferrets, there's a good chance if you treat both of them at the same time, you may be able to eliminate the disease. But it can be a chronic disease. So that's a big one of ferret, ferret diarrhea um, is the coronavirus or green slime disease. Okay, I'm going to go through a few of the other pocket pets here, but just because of the time frame, I'm just going to touch on these diseases. Guinea pigs, we've all seen guinea pigs. They make great little pets for little kids. They have a number of uh, problems. Vitamin C, these guys need vitamin C just like we do. They're from the New World. They're from the Andes Mountains in South America. So you have to supplement them with vitamin C. Now, true guinea pig pellets should have vitamin C in them. However, vitamin C does not last very long in the environment or in the food. So if it's been out there for a little bit, they say longer than maybe six months, the vitamin C is gone. So you have to supplement with vitamin C. So it's very important to buy fresh guinea pig pellets um, at a reliable source that haven't been sitting on the shelf for a long time. And then I supplement all guinea pigs with vitamin C. <coughs> and put one 250 milligram chewable orange vitamin C tablet in their water bottle every day, and that tends to give them enough vitamin C. You just have to make sure they get used to the taste for the first couple days, and then they seem to like it quite a bit. So any guinea pig that comes in for any reason, it's unthrifty, not doing very well, it could be vitamin C deficiency or scurvy. They can get broken bones because of it, just like in other animals that are, you know, especially people, they can end up getting rickets if they don't have vitamin C. Dystocia. This is very important in guinea pigs. Guinea pigs' pelvises fuse at six months of age. So if a guinea pig does not have babies before six months of age, when it goes to have babies after that, she will become blocked because her pelvis will not be able to expand. So if you're going to breed guinea pigs, you have to at least breed them the first time before they're six months so the pelvis does not fuse together. So when people call you, they're having a guinea pig, it's straining, it's having babies, you've got to ask them how long have you had it, if it's been you know, more than six months, more than likely the pelvis is fused, and you're going to have to do surgery to get the baby So, The interesting thing about guinea pig babies, though, is that they um, do not need the mother, so if the mother dies during the surgery, you might have to supplement them with just fluids and get them onto eating right away, soft foods, and they can survive just fine. This is called precocial, so they're... Um, um, allowed to, they're like chickens, the babies hatch and are ready to go, the same with the guinea pigs. So if there is a problem and the mother dies during the surgery, you can still raise the babies quite fine. The other thing guinea pigs get is pododermatitis, and this is usually from being kept in an improper environment, usually on a wire cage, or if they're kept in a cage that doesn't have very much bedding, um, 
and they're running around in their urine, they will get infections in their feet. Usually, if you correct the environment, have the people cleaning the cage twice a week, and put them on a broad-spectrum antibiotic, um, that usually clears up. With any of these small um, pocket pets, such as guinea pigs, rabbits, um, mice, hamsters, anything like that, antibiotic selection, you must be very careful. Most of these guys, to some extent, uh, have hindgut fermentation. So if you give them anything that will wipe out gram-positive bacteria, you can shut their GI tract down, and this is called dysbiosis. This is very common in rabbits and chinchillas and guinea pigs as well. So you can't give any of the um, penicillins to small pocket pets. And I have a little acronym. It's called PLACE. Plates are the antibiotics that you should not give the little small fuzzy animals. And so what that stands for is penicillins, lincomycins, amoxicillins, cephalexin, and erythromycin. Any of those in any of the small animals will shut their gut down. So a lot of times we end up going to what? Well, everyone talks about enrofloxacin. You're always giving, you know, exotic enrofloxacin. And that's why, because the enrofloxacin is more gram-negative than gram-positive, it tends to work very well in these little guys, and you can give it orally with, like, orange juice or something. The other thing we can commonly use is trimethoprim sulfa in these little guys, and it works pretty well. Um, and another thing is chloramphenicol works very well, but it is very limited use because of the aplastic anemia in people uh, that are handling that. So use the enrofloxacin. So remember, place penicillin, lincomycin, amoxicillin, cephalexins, and erythromycin can all wipe out the gut floor, so that's very important. So rabbits, the main big problems rabbits get are malocclusion, and usually they have problems with their incisors, the front teeth, and we don't know why. We think it's a number of reasons, maybe breathing, maybe they're chewing on things and damage the tissue in there. The teeth don't actually end up occluding against each other and overgrowing. They can grow very fast, up to like a centimeter a month. And so you'll have to trim these teeth on a continual basis. The other thing I always look at with all these small animals is to look in their mouth at their mol uh, molar teeth. And you use that with the op um, your little cones for looking in the ears, um, your op uh, sorry, your otoscope. And just take a look back in at the teeth and make sure they're nice and flat and square. They can develop points on them just like horses and you might have to go in there and crunch them off. So any of these little guys that are showing any signs of anorexia, the first place to always look at the teeth because they have teeth problems. The other big problem rabbits get is pastorellosis. They get pastorella multosida infections. Remember I said in reptiles, you basically consider all reptiles have salmonella. Well, you should consider all rabbits have pastorella, whether showing it or not. And this manifests itself in a number of ways. Usually the most common one is snuffles in rabbits. And snuffles is when they get a pastoral infection in, in their nose and in their eyes they get watering eyes and they'll get a runny nose. And this can migrate up and get into the ears and you can also get the rabbit spinning around because it get, they have otitis media. And it can also cause abscesses inside the rabbit. So any problem with the rabbit you have to consider uh, pastoralosis. So look for um, increased white blood cell counts or you can actually try culturing if you, you know, get into an abscess. Um, treatment for that, once again, is enrofloxacin. Uh, the problem with enrofloxacin, though, is even though you're treating um, pastoralosis, it can come back. So you might be able to knock it back for a while, but eventually it's going to come back. So you have to warn the owners about that. The other thing rabbits get is GI stasis. GI stasis is when a rabbit shows up and the people saying he's not eating, he's not drinking very much, and he isn't passing feces. Normally, this is related to how much roughage they're eating. People feed rabbits rabbit pellets. Well, even though rabbit pellets were developed for rabbits, it was developed by lab animal people to keep rabbits alive for a very short time in a lab situation. Rabbits really only need to get, and this is our formula for feeding rabbits, a quarter cup of rabbit pellets per five pounds of rabbit per day. So if you had a five pound rabbit, you could get a quarter cup of rabbit pellets a day. Rabbit pellets have too high of a calcium in them, and they have too much fat in them. The rabbits tend to get really porky on them, and they absorb too much calcium. Why this is a problem, rabbits excrete about 30 times more calcium in their urine than other mammals, such as humans. And whenever you see a rabbit urinate on the floor, it'll look quite cloudy. So if you start putting extra calcium into the diet, 
is going to go through the urine system and you're going to end up getting your urolithiasis or calcium type stones in the bladder. This is very common in rabbits. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is the pellets don't have the right length of roughage in them. Even though they have a lot of roughage, it's not the right physical length. You have to pre-feed pre-choice grass hays um, such as Timothy because what happens is when the hay is chewed up by the rabbit and goes through the GI system, their system is designed to break that down. This length of roughage also snags any of the hair that the rabbit has ingested and pulls it out. So if you don't feed them the hay, the hair will build up in the stomach and cause a trichobes or, or a hairball in the stomach. And this can also cause the GI system to shut down because the stomach could just be full of hair. And how we rule this out is I usually look on radio, take an x-ray, look at the abdomen and see if there's a, a, you know, a mass in the stomach. And usually, if there is, it's in a hairball. We can manage that medically. Occasionally, you have to go in surgically, but surgically. But usually now, I manage those medically by force feeding. We start them um, on a force feeding diet and lots of fluids and lactulose to help, you know, soften that thing up and get it out of there. If it doesn't work after a week of trying, you might have to go in surgically. So the big reason for the GI stasis then can be hairballs in the stomach not feeding the proper food, the hairballs cause um, dehydration, they block everything up, and then the rabbit shuts down. Or, for whatever reason, if some other veterinarian or someone has given these drug uh, animals like penicillin for an infection, um, it could actually shut the um, gram-positive bacteria in the gut down and kind of stop the gut from moving. So sometimes you can give them um, yogurt or lactobacillus bacteria in the supplementation to help try and kickstart uh, the rabbit's GI system again. So GI stasis is very common in rabbits, but it's very treatable. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about are mice and rats. Um, mice and rats can get a number of diseases, but the things we usually see them presenting for are neoplasia, mammary neoplasia. And both mice and rats get them, but the thing you need to remember is that mice get the malignant mammary tumors, whereas rats get the benign ones. So this is important um, for prognosis. If you get a little mouse in that's got a, a tumor, you can almost assume that it's malignant. You can always do a biopsy and submit it, but that lifespan of that rat is very limited and is very guarded prognosis. You should probably not even, you can attempt to remove it, but more likely if it is a malignant form, it's already spread to other places in the body. However, in rats, rats can get very large mammary tumors, either in one place on the chain or in the entire chain on both sides, and they're usually benign. So I always, if someone comes in and they've got a rat that's maybe a year old, it's got a tumor starting, I usually wait till they're about a centimeter in size before I dissect them. You take them to surgery and you can easily surgically remove them. They're encapsulated. They might have a blood supply and you can close the skin behind them. Um, and you might have to go back again at some other point and remove them. I always submit them though because there's always a chance they could be malignant. But usually, um, very few are malignant, they're most of the time benign, so it's definitely worth attempting the surgery. Okay, fish. I'll go through a couple slides of fish. Obviously, fish is a, could be a whole lecture on itself, but these are some of the most common things that we see in fish. And I'm usually going to be talking about freshwater fish here. So I'll go through some parasites, some bacterial diseases, and a couple fungal diseases. Well, the most common fish disease that people see, and if you've had a tank, you've probably had it, is ick. Well, what is ick? It's actually an external protozoal disease with a very complicated life history. It lives on the fish, it has a free-swimming form that swims around the tank, and then it has another form that lives down in the gravel. So what happens is if um, the big problem with this disease, if you wipe one of the forms out, it can come back a couple weeks later because of the ones living in the gravel. So it's very difficult to treat. It's also called um, white spot disease. And you'll see in the picture here and picture C there, the little tiny white spots that look like little grains of sugar or salt all over that fish. And here you can see also in the histo sections on the one in the lower left, number E, that there's actually um, some of the ick there and it actually has a horseshoe shaped nucleus. That's very important to remember. If you ever um, see this on a fish and you took a scraping of that and looked at under light microscopy, you can see that horse-shaped shoe uh, nucleus in there, and that is ick. It'll be swimming around. So how you treat ick, um, there's a number of ways of doing it. It's quite complicated, but you can increase the temperature in the tank. That makes the life cycle go quicker. 
Um, a lot of people end up actually scrubbing the tank out, um, putting the fish, treating them with um, a formalin bath or actually a salt bath to try and kill the guys that are on, the, the ick that are living on the fish and um, putting them back in a new tank. And this usually what people can do is if you take the fish out of the tank into a quarantine tank with no rocks in them, you heat up the other tank, let the cycle run through with no fish in there, the ick will die out, you can treat it with salt, and then treat the fish in the other tank with, with salt as well and, and changing the water. And it usually works out quite well. Another external uh, protozoal disease where you can see little um, spots is also uh, trichodoniasis. And if you do a scraping of the fish, where you usually just take the fish out of the water, uh, we can anesthetize them or just scrape it with the back of a slide and wipe it on another slide. You can see these little protozoal diseases, and they have the same treatment as well. <coughs> Some of the internal parasites we see on fish, um, angelfish, very popular. Any angelfish that's wasting and they're not acting right, hexanema is a very common internal um, protozoal that causes uh, enteritis. And we treat that with metronidazole actually in the water and it clears up quite well, as well as microsporidia. Fish, just like anything else, can get external parasites. Um, and you can actually see these crawling around on the fish in many cases if you look very closely. And these are dactylogyra and gyrodactylids. And these guys have big teeth on the front of them that hook into the fish and they kind of eat through the mucus. And these can definitely be treated with salt dips. If you have a freshwater fish, um, you can make a salt dip, put the fish in it for like 10 to 15 minutes. The amount of salt in there will kill the parasites. It'll stress the fish a bit, but it'll kill the parasites and you can put the fish back into the, the fresh water. Some of the most common um, lesions in the skin of fish are bacterial lesions. And you can have parasites that cause these, and then the bacteria takes over. And it's usually aromonas, and it's also known as, you know, just septicemia. And here you can see in two goldfish, two classic lesions, where we've got a, a lesion that's surrounded by an area of red hyperemia, and this would be considered a, um, a, a bacterial infection. Now, you can scrape these, but you can also just start the fish on antibiotics. Usually, it has to do with some other improper husbandry condition, like poor water quality, or they've got parasites as well. So, they really need a full workup, but aromonas is very popular. Um, the other bacterial disease quite popular is columnaris disease. This is the same thing. You can see in other animals uh, caused by Flexibacter columnaris. It's usually in cool water. People can catch this. Um, if it's in uh, air conditioning systems. <clears throat> it causes little, uh, it's also called um, fin rot or tail rot. You see the, the, the fins just looking very poor. And it can also be caused saddle disease. I'll show you a picture here in a second. And it causes necrotic areas on the skin and fins um, and uh, satellite tail markings behind the dorsal fin. And here you can see the dorsal fin on these guys, which is highlighted by the different arrows and the lesion it causes. That can also be treated with antibiotics in the water or the larger fish can be injected. Another thing, well, just like everything else, fish get tuberculosis. And people who actually keep fish can get tuberculosis, um, but it's usually it just in their skin. It's called fish handler's disease. They usually get a nodule. They have a cut and they're working in the water around fish. They get the TB and a little nodule grows. Um, more than likely, it's Mycobacterium fortulum or Marinum, and it causes granulomas, usually inside the fish in the GI tract, and can end up causing wasting. And here you can actually see a granuloma on the uh, surface of the fish, and the histosection inside, and you can see the multiple microabscesses and granulomas within that lesion. Now, if you get this in a tank, I would consider um, there's really no good treatment for it. You should probably just euthanize all the fish in the tank and clean the tank out with bleach to make sure you get rid of it because this will persist in your tank forever. Fish can also get fungus. This is also related to uh, poor husbandry. And if you can see uh, sacrolegnia and uh, achyla are two very common ones. And this usually looks like this white fluffy growth on the fish. And here you can see a picture of a fish with it growing off its back behind its dorsal fin and the scraping of it, and usually just by um, increasing the temperature of the water and having proper husbandry, you should have a problem getting rid of the uh, fungus in the fish. And so now I'll uh, entertain any questions.